Hike Beautiful Bilrica. Walking the trails of Ralph Hill Conservation Area in Vietnam Veterans Memorial Park, Bilirica. The 240 acre park has recreation area off Treble Cove Road across from the Bilrica House of Correction. With a memorial specifically dedicated to six Bilirica young men who died in combat during the Vietnam War. At the time, a committee decided to purpose the land for families to honor the young men who lost their lives, who would never have a family. It's a park for a radio control flyer area. There's a BMX racetrack, soccer fields, an equestrian area for horse shows, and the Billerica Dog Park, which at the time of producing this video was not yet completed. Winning Pond allows fishing and there's a dock and a ramp. Trails are mapped for the area west of Route 3, but east of Route 3 has trails as well. The conservation area has woodlands, wetlands and river shoreline. Now before this was a park for families, it was Middlesex County land. Historically, it has been the farm of the Billerica House of Correction. While this is your first offense, it shows, young men, that you've made a very poor choice trying to live outside the law. You can become bitter and disillusioned by your conviction, or you can accept it as an opportunity to learn the law-abiding way to cope with your problems. It is in my power to give you a chance to learn your lesson under the guidance of men who are firm and resolute, but whose training and personal interest have given them an outstanding record of successful rehabilitations. I am committing you to the Middlesex County House of Correction at Bill Ricker. People having convicted the criminal by due process of law have entrusted him to the sheriff's department and the man they have elected, the county's highest ranking law enforcement officer, High Sheriff Howard W. Fitzpatrick. This is the Middlesex County House of Correction at Bill Ricker, Massachusetts, an immense and complex establishment designed not merely to incarcerate and punish wrongdoers, but with the purpose of building character, self-respect, and the high regard for the personal rights and properties of their fellow citizens. Although this institution is of the highest standards in efficiency and comfort, here the lawbreaker will lose personal freedom and know the stigma of bars and ever-watching officers, probably the worst punishment a man can humanely be made to endure. The executive officer is Deputy Master and Keeper John F. Brocklesby. On top of the enormity of his job administering housing, security, farm and factory with his staff, the Keeper has to cope with problems of which no private citizen would dream. He is concerned with every facet of the lives of his wards. He must guard against such major disasters as an epidemic, 
He must produce goods with a workforce that has little incentive to work. On call 24 hours a day, he lives, no matter how humane he is, with the threat of rebellion. For even in the best-run institution, there is only the thinnest line between calm and violence. Of awesome effects on the new arrival, these walls and scores of scrupulously locked doors are the accommodations for up to 400 inmates and some 70 officers containing their lives and occupations in busy, well-organized routine. Turned over to the receiving department, the new inmates are prepared for examination, identification, and assignment. If these men are to be rehabilitated, everything about them must first be known. Not only their criminal record, but also their habits their personality traits. Stripped of clothing and personal possessions, which are impounded and checked until their release, they are issued the traditional trademark of the penitent. The clean, comfortable, but purely functional prison uniform. The uniforms are made by the inmates here in the tailoring shop. Gray and drab, they become the identification of men who have renounced their privileges as private citizens. Where men must live so closely together, a thorough medical examination must prove them healthy and free from communicable diseases. The staff doctor will accept them as fit or commit them for observation or treatment in the institution hospital. Further classification by intelligence, temperament, and aptitude will determine work assignments. Identification will be positive. The past will become a carefully documented record of fingerprints and age, of complexion and accent, of tattoos and dentures, of arresting officers and accomplices. Henceforth, an index number is as important as a name. A copy of the record is filed. Another forwarded to the Massachusetts Department of Public Safety. And a third copy is sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Who are these men who populate our reformatories? The average inmate is a man who has been in and out of trouble since grammar school. He might be a petty thief with little skill and very poor judgment who jeopardizes his freedom to steal a few dollars. A youngster with a yen to joyride in a car he can't afford to buy. Often more of a social misfit than an enemy of society. Others are exceptionally dangerous for while they have not yet committed their major crime, they are capable of the most odious conduct. What can the House of Correction do for these men and still keep faith with the society that committed them? Society in its sentence has decreed confinement, work, and an opportunity to reform. The first of these conditions has been met. The culprit is now a member of the penal community. controlled steel doors close, giving each man his modicum of privacy, leaving him to his sleep or to the quiet turning of his conscience. While time drags on and sleep relieves the inevitable monotony of daily routine, the institution never sleeps. Throughout the night hours, 
As in any community of size, security, maintenance, and utilities continue. With early morning comes the demand for power. Equal to the demand for heat, light, and power is the engineering staff tending the production, generation, and distribution of the self-sufficient electrical system. In no way burdening the resources of the town of Dorica, the House of Correction operates its own water and waste systems. Typical of the up-to-date installations is the filtration plant. Essential but costly, the financing of such equipment must, to an extent, be offset by revenue from the industrial shops. Here, the condition that the inmate must work is met. This may seem a far cry from hard labor, as most people understand it. Certainly unlike the chain gangs and rock piles of just a few years ago. But more humane, more rewarding to the worker, and infinitely more profitable. In the carpentry and brush shops are turned out the products for sale to agencies and other institutions observing the laws against prison-made goods competing on the open market, but nonetheless lightening the taxpayer's burden. Penal officers are aware that most of these men have never held down a steady job, have little skill or love for work, and the endeavor here is not only to train them in useful trades, but also to have them accept labor as a law-abiding citizen's everyday obligation. Many other essential jobs make up the inmate's work schedule, and time is allocated for his personal grooming and housekeeping. The master well realizes how important meals are to the general morale and successful operation of the kitchen is of major importance. The feeding of such a large number becomes a staggering job, compounded by the fact that most of the meats, vegetables, and fruits comes from the institution's own livestock and produce farm. Although produced and prepared economically, no better food could be served. Menus are carefully planned for variety. The modern stainless steel equipment, the finest of ingredients, and the surveillance of a steward, a chef, and a baker make meals the high point of any day. For many of the inmates, the lack of such simple pleasures as good and regular meals was one of the factors contributing to their delinquency. Preparing for the next meal keeps the staff, assisted by inmates, busy through the day. Here, 1,100 loaves of bread are baked every week. Butchering of the prime pig carcasses is done under the most hygienic conditions. Walk-in freezers are used for storage. Meat cutting is done under top security to prevent the smuggling of knives and utensils. Here, even as in the dining hall, silverware is carefully counted and inventoried. For any man who loves his freedom, 
a penal institution, no matter how benevolently run, is still a drab world of huge walls and steel bars. Routine wears out a man's patience. Idleness can be dangerous. Yet, time must be allowed for leisure and social contact. Sports are encouraged, and in the evening, the free period allows for radio, television, cards. Many men during this period work on extension study courses for a high school diploma sponsored by the state. Over a letter from home, a man can probably best resolve to make a better life. The officer's job requires not only that he put in his time, but also that he have the talent and the training for it. Physically fit and ever alert to any infraction that might lead to rebellious conduct, the penal officer must have the ability to cope with any situation. Devoted to doing an unpleasant but essential job, these men inspire respect and cooperation. Among these men who have violated the code of conventional behavior, there are bound to be those who rebel against authority and so threaten the closely guarded discipline. In the isolation cells, they will have the chance to ponder the advantages of accepting the rule. The padded cell stands as a monument to man's debauchery and capacity for self-destruction. The dental and medical clinics provide for the health of the inmate. Here men are treated not only for illness or injury sustained while in confinement, but are also taught to cultivate good personal health habits. Stewards and male nurses tend the bright, roomy wards. Proof of the spirit of cooperation inculcated into these men is the fact that every two months, some 70 of them will freely donate their blood to the American Red Cross. Good health is an important step in the therapy toward physical and mental restoration. Chaplains of the three major faiths provide for the spiritual needs of the penitent. Personal problems are taken to the chaplain, who is always ready as a man of God to heed even the least of his brethren. The chaplain often is the only person able to reach the last instinct for love and morality in the transgressor's heart. Men whose only code for living was a brutal bid for selfish gain are taught to accept the divine edicts of love of fellow man, to know repentance, and to reform. The chapel is designed to accommodate all services, and to each member of this congregation it becomes a sentimental and spiritual link with a better life. O oh Lord, I love the beauty of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. Destroy not my soul with the impious, O oh God, now my life with men of blood. I will walk in my innocence, 
rescue me and be gracious to me. Having a loved one serving a sentence can be a very trying ordeal. The general public is seldom tolerant of the man who has made a mistake and those who remain loyal to him. Belonging the inmates' experiences under custody can be almost maddening, and the visit is a tender, bittersweet event. As satisfactory progress reports on behavior, adaptability, attitude, personal interviews, and the passing of time bring the inmate closer to rehabilitation, he is made a trustee. As a trustee, he will enjoy greater freedom working outdoors or in the trustee quarters. The trustee dormitory has roomier accommodations and a lighter routine will allow more recreational time. These men are a good security risk since they have less than six months of their sentence to serve. At this point, most of these men have been helped to file a parole petition for which they are eligible after serving at least half of their sentence. Behavior has become an everyday habit with these men. The farm is operated by the trustees. Mechanized in every possible way for efficient operation, it contains facilities for hog raising and dairy production. The modern milk room processes 200,000 quarts of milk annually. The 260 cultivated acres yield a crop of tomatoes, squash, corn, fruit. This crop, as well as an annual 80 tons of pork, will be shared with the other Middlesex County institution, the East Cambridge House of Correction and Jail. The cannery cooks and cans 30,000 gallons of vegetables each year to supply the kitchen. The lesson in common decency and respect for the law is slow and tedious, but it is a lesson that must be well taught. What these men learn here is important. It is important to them, and it is important to all of us, for soon some of these men will return to live among us. For the High Sheriff and his special sheriff, Robert Fitzpatrick, the greatest satisfaction comes with the release of a man successfully rehabilitated. For this is the object of their efforts, and the evidence of an assignment well met. John, you've done a good job with that young fellow. 
You know, running a house of correction can be a difficult and heartbreaking job. We take pride in our endeavor to rehabilitate. Every man leaving here is wiser, more skillful, and better adjusted to life's problems. He now has a second chance to cope with conditions in the outside world and to become a credit to society. They are now in the hands of the public to help them on as useful citizens. Appearing in scenes of this film, unrecognizable and anonymous, was an actual inmate released while we were in production. These were his own unsolicited comments as he said goodbye. They've been done good to me here. I always was in trouble, even when I was a kid, even after I got married. Trouble with the in-laws, where I worked. After a while, you figure nobody gives a hang, and you start making your own breaks. Here, these guys look after you and give you a chance to straighten yourself out. Like the sheriff, he gave me this suit and some money, and he's got a job lined up for me on the outside. People give you a break, you've got to play it straight. I'm going to be all right now. Sixty years ago, Sheriff Fitzpatrick created a legacy of prison reform. And today, Sheriff Kutujan is about to create a legacy of criminal justice reform. Take a look at this trailer, which describes the current criminal justice reform. Sheriff Kutujan was quoted as saying that the documentary is riveting, gritty, powerful, and provocative. But, he said, it is not a film. It is real life. We go into prison, we get a handbook on how to conduct ourselves within that prison system. Two years later, three years later, you get released, but don't get a handbook on how to live life. How many guys have been to jail more than once? Is there anybody in here that's working on a plan so that you don't come back one of the reasons that I became a counselor is because when I got out of prison, I didn't have anything. I'm doing this because I don't want to see them end up back in prison. When you're by yourself, it's one thing, but then you've got a family now. Your obligation is to pay by a certain amount on everything that's due and all at once, and the pressures just come. If I go back to the streets, four or five hours, I would make two paychecks here. If I take my life, okay, my family will grieve for like a week or two, but at least they'll be fine after that. When a person's been institutionalized for years, to come back to a community that has nothing for them, he's gonna snap. I've been getting high for like 10 years. I do a couple bits and get out, everything's good, go to meetings for a little while, and then you slip up, you fall back in the same place. I'm pretty upset about this because I was the one on the street. I was the one who did I know? We used to live in a certain way for so long, we don't know no other way. That created an identity for myself. I had to abandon that identity because that identity didn't bring me nothing but pain and suffering. God is good, and he answered my prayer today. I said, please help me, and he sent you guys, yo. We're not giving up, man. We're here for you, baby.